Welcome to Autism Lifeline Links Across the Spectrum, another Facebook Live broadcast. Today we are broadcasting live from the Texas um, Transition Conference here in San Antonio. Um, the Texas Transition Conference has been going on for many years and a lot of our stakeholders are a part of this conference. And it's a project out of Texas A&M Center on Disability and Development. So we're really excited to be here today, um, broadening our circle, hope more friends are turning in that have never necessarily heard of any of our entities or of um, Autism Lifeline Links. So thanks for letting us be here and broadcast from here uh, to the Texas A&M and the Texas Transition Conference. My name is Karen Brain, and I um, the job of Autism Lifeline Links is really to convene stakeholders throughout our community who are working with people with autism and developmental disabilities. And we work to try to get all of these clients, um, whether they are little guys or older people on the spectrum and with IDD, to um, get them connected with services and resources that do exist in our community, but also on the backside identifying gaps and barriers to care in our community so that we can collectively, with all these stakeholders, work to improve that system of care, reduce some of these barriers, impact public policy, so we can really create a much better community for um, everyone who cares for somebody or everybody who is on the spectrum um, or has a comorbid intellectual disability. So I am so excited. Um, we have many friends here, and they were at the conference. We were sitting around at one of our work group meetings, which we have many, many of those every month. And this um, Giovanni was saying, well, we're going to be at the Texas Transition Conference. And me and Myra and Sam are doing the, uh, are out laying out a new model for collaboration between the three entities that they're a part of about transitions and making sure that people with intellectual disabilities are really connected through that timeline of um, from school to work and then supports thereafter to make sure that they have the greatest level of independence that they can possibly have. So we're excited for that. So here we are today and they're, um, this is basically, they have their panel right after this. And so this is their this is their dry run. Right? This is their this is their 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 panel light. As I said yesterday, we broadcast yesterday for, with another panel. And so this is their dry run. So they get all their butterflies out. Not that these guys have many of those. But um, so their panel is called Alamo Area Interagency Transition Collaborative 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 Model. Um, roadmap, roadmap for navigating the transition process. So to my right, we have Sam Gonzalez with a Z. They make that mistake for my boys all the time. Uh, education consultant at Region 20. And we have to my left, the lovely Miss Myra Gutierrez, and she is with the Texas Workforce Solutions and the Vocational Rehab, um, steering that part for them. And then of course to the far left, we have uh, the, the, the amazing Giovanni Washington, and he is the, with the Alamo Local Authority, I mean Alamo Council, Alamo Area Council of Governments, or ACOG as we call it here, which is our local LIDA, which is our uh, Intellectual Developmental Disability Authority here in San Antonio. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you. I'm so thank excited you. to have you. I know, I'm excited. Was it the and, and again, so one of the things we were telling people is everybody out there, there may be people who know the lingo, know the jargon, but most of them are people who are just trying to tune in. So these Facebook Lives were really created last year. We do them once a month on varied topics. It's just to raise community awareness and get people that primer of information and then they can click away at your sites. Uh, people can click away onto the Texas Transition Conference website and get uh, get be able to see their entire presentation packet. So we're just doing the high level primer and talking about why is so right, why is transition important? What what's what is transition? What's the big deal? What, why why is it important? Um, and what does transition mean to a lay person? Gene? Well uh, transitions happen all across our lifespan, but in particular with the individual students and families that we're working with uh, particularly here in um, San Antonio and Barry County, uh, the one main transition that's going to happen is transitioning from the high school setting out into the community. And what does that process look like for individuals, in particular with IED, intellectual or developmental disabilities? And so what we thought of as a, um, as a group here is to come up with a model that kind of helps parents and those individuals um, walk them through that transition process, what to look for, um, what services should be in place, uh, where to get those services exactly, um, what those services may cost, um, you know, how do you qualify for those services. So hopefully with the information that we'll be sharing today, um, both through the uh, Facebook Live um, 
event uh, right now and also through our presentation here at the conference, um, a lot of families will get to be a better understanding of what it is exactly transition looks like and what are those um, su supports and services that should be in place to help with that transition process for your student. And so traditionally, transition in this sense is, as Jim I said, we all have transitions, but, like, but so often uh, the population, the uh, autism and IDD population, they, we've had a lot of listening sessions um, in, in, with adults or self-advocates, as we like to say, who have autism and intellectual disabilities, and they have the same hopes, dreams, desires as anybody else's, any neurotypical. They want to have an apartment. They want to have a relationship. They want to have friends. They want to go out. They want to do all these things. And one of those biggest things that they all want is a job. Mm -hmm. They want employment. They want to be a part of it because no matter their intellectual functioning, they see and experience people on TV, they on their on social media, and in their world having all these things. Why, why shouldn't they be able to have the same thing? Knowing that we need modifications. So can you start from the education level? Because the first gateway really is getting people to know after what happens after the school bus stops, right? Or the language was, what happens when the school bus stops? When the yellow bus stops. When the yellow bus stops, you're not gonna, you, you don't want to just go home and watch Netflix all day, right. even though we don't like that. Well, but I mean, yes, you know. That's right. So, I mean, so let me go back to what is transition. So, from the education standpoint, transition is, is law. Um, federal law is by age 16, a transition plan needs to be in place in the child's IEP. In Texas, we use age 14 because we're bigger and better in Texas. So, by age 14, a transition plan needs to be in, in place in the student's IEP. And that transition plan is really looking at their student's life after high school. You know, there's a quote that we have in our presentation from Stephen Covey that talks about beginning with the end in mind. And so, I'm not gonna read the entire quote here, but if you look at that, what is the end game for the students? You know, what are their expectations? And by building that end game at age 14 in a sense, you can start building the plan. You know, what does the child wanna be? And if, uh, like the session this morning talked about, it really is expectations. Yeah. Having the high expectations for all students. Um, IDD, autism, whatever your disability is, what is the expectations they have? And sometimes, you know, those expectations aren't very high sometimes. But you know, students all have wants, dreams, desires. They all want to get married. They want to have a job. They want to be successful and do what their regular non-disabled peers are doing. So that transition planning is law in the IP, and it starts to look at students' post-secondary goals. The post-secondary goals are goals that are projections of what they're going to do when they leave high school. And when I say leave, I'm talking about when, when FAPE no longer applies. So FAPE is a free and appropriate public education. And that's in a sense when the ALOBA stops. Yeah. When FAPE stops, what is the life going to look like when they leave school? Were they prepared for school? Were they prepared to go to college? Were they, were they made aware that there's an office of disability support so they can give them accommodations? Were they prepared understanding their services through ACAR, the Texas Workforce Commission, that can provide them with, with uh, job coaches, with um, any other services they might need in the home, um, and whatever supports they are. And that planning starts at age 14 in the IEP with goals. You know, the goals they have they work on in school, the supports they have, the classes they're taking, um, because in school, through FAPE, everything is free, through IDEA and through, uh, and through FAPE. But sometimes, the example I always use is if a child has a one-on-one -on -one provider, has an adult following them in a sense through high school because of the need, and they're going to need that adult when they leave school, the adult's not going to go with them. When they yeah. graduate, the adult's going to stay with school, they're an employee of the school. Yeah. But if they still need that service... Where it's going to come from. Right. Who, who, and who's going to pay the individual? And, and especially who's going to pay the Yeah, who's going to pay the And so the IEP for everybody is just the individual education plan, which if you are classified as a child with special needs um, in, in, in the school, you, you, everyone has an IEP that is basically laying out how modifications right. going to be made and what are the plans. And so we do do a bigger and better in Texas uh, with age 14. And so many people are often talking about, you know, for guys that um, have intellectual dis disabilities, we don't help them to really vision, right? Because the family maybe can't vision the best possible future because there's so many things mm -hmm. going on. Whereas um, for neuro neurotypical children and families, we're constantly like, I want to be a doctor, I want to be, a, I want well, to be a zoologist, I want to be whatever. Right? I, so I how do you start that? Early? Well, it's interesting because I went to a conference a few years ago, and the presenter talked about how when you walk into an elementary school room. And, and you see the kids, you ask them, what do you want to be grow up? Yeah. What do you like? But he said, if you walk into a special education room, uh -huh. like think of a high school room, 
We don't ever ask those questions yeah. to those kids. Yeah. When those kids have the same dreams and desires as everybody else. Yeah. So it's really having that expectation early on with students and having that early on career exploration, having on that early on, what do they like doing, what are their needs? Do they like playing sports? Do they like playing outside? Do they like with their friends? Do they like being on the computer? Having those, so early on, it really, it really, really yes. in, in, in my, I, I'm an advocate for really starting before age 14. Yeah. Really starting in, in elementary school, um, it's no longer called PPCD, it's called Early Childhood Special Education, ECSC is another acronym for you. I know, right. Um, but it's really starting early on with those expectations, early on with, the, with what you want students to do. And then part of it too is, is education of the parents also. Okay, so with that, yesterday our, so go back and look at our Facebook Live and some of the other ones, because we talk a lot, running that theme through mm -hmm. a lot of our Facebook Lives of um, parents who have an individual with special needs in their home, there's a lot going on, right? And you, there's so many other things coming in at you, but one of the things that's so important is starting young and early with expectations of, um, you can do this, and then, but the hardest part is getting the parent to realize that that individual who they know has some intellectual capacity deficits, it's like, but, but they can't. So we were joking yesterday about the Marlin and Nemo of, you think you can do these things, Nemo, but you can't. And so Nemo, of course, does everything because Nemo's determined. So our guys can do everything that they set their minds to with some modifications and accommodations, but knowing that they're supported is really important. So Myra is with the Texas Workforce um, Group, and she I want you to talk a little bit about, we can say, oh my God, I want to be an astronaut. So one of my favorite stories, I have my roommate from college worked at United Cerebral Palsy in Manhattan. And she had a guy who said he wanted to be an astronaut. And of course he has an intellectual disability and cerebral palsy. And she's like, okay, right? And so we all know, like, and he's, he's not going to be an astronaut. But they worked so hard to make sure that they found something. He works the planetarium. Okay, so maybe you're not going to go to the moon, but man, you're going to be a part of this. Yeah. What's your passion? What's your purpose? So can you talk a little bit about what your entity does and helping people find that passion, purpose, placement, right? Because even we joke, I don't still don't know what I want to do when I grow up, but I'm just really lucky to keep doing stuff a lot, right? So how do you guys do that? Because that's tough. It is, and so with us, with the Vocational Rehab Services, we also start at age 14 because early intervention is key. Um, and so that's when we start exploring uh, career exploration. That's a big piece, especially for those 14-year-olds. We really want to focus on the career exploration by uh, talking with them about their interests, their uh, abilities, and what they would like to do in the future. If they say they want to be an astronaut, then we, we ask those questions. We probe, we ask, what do you like about being an astronaut? You know, what, what are some of the things that make you want to do that? Uh, I had a case where I had a, a student who wanted to be a doctor, and we were like, okay, well, what, what makes you want to be a doctor? Yeah. And he's like, well, I just want to wear scrubs because they're Dude, comfortable. Dude, we can go to the army surplus, you know? Like and that, so, right? Like, yeah. it, it, but that comes with building that rapport, yeah. building that relationship with the students, and having those communication with the student, with the parents, and input from the school, from the parents, from the family, yeah. um, and all of us talking together about, you know, what job do they want, what skills it requires, and kind of starting, you know, one step at a time, right? If they want to be an astronaut, let's start here, let's see what we can do, asking the questions to get the information out and really figuring out what they really like about that field. Yeah. Um, and then guiding them to a realistic um, goal so that we can set them up for success. Absolutely. Right. Okay, so when we look at all of these factors, so we've got school, we've got the employment, and when we look at what the role of um, ACOG and the LIDA is, so often, to Sam's point, somebody has to pay for all this, right? Something has to work out. So how do you guys help in that? Everything from what we, what we talk about, we know is like getting people on waiver interest lists early so that they have those service fees that they can access for future to support success. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, primarily, the first step is to actually get on the waiver list, and that's very key, as uh, Kara mentioned, and that involves the long-term services and supports programs. Yes, we're working hard to. Well, no, we're, we're, that's one of our other projects of this, pro of this of all. It's like because waivers, we're working to correct our own vernacular because when we talk in the medical space, they're like, yeah, all our clients are on waivers. Like, 
No, long-term service is support waiver, sir. So go. Ahead. Yes, absolutely. So that's the first step: is to contact your local intellectual and developmental disability authority. You can Google that information. Um, find out what the closest one um, is to you here in the state of Texas. Here in San Antonio, it's ACOG. So it comes to our front door, you fill out the application, uh, we'll get you on a wait list to be seen by our intake team, which also includes testing by our psychological, our psychological team. So that's the very first step to determine eligibility. From there, there is a wait list involved. Um, typically for our safety net program, which is sort of the baseline program that we have for individuals, it's about a two to three or four year wait. Uh, but the key thing is to actually get on that waiting list. And then once you uh, get further along, there's a waiver program, which are Medicaid funded programs. So Medicaid is the key um, yeah. component of having that program. But again, we'll assist you in establishing Medicaid, maintaining your Medicaid so that all those services will eventually be paid for um, through Medicaid, and of course, we know that's funded through both state and federal money, your tax money, um, for the purposes of this um, discussion. Um, so it's really key uh, for you to get into services through your local IDD authority um, to maintain or to establish the Medicaid. And even if you think you're not eligible for Medicaid, at least go through the process. There may be other program or funding sources that you're eligible for that you didn't think you were, um, but again, the IDD authority will assist you in finding those. And so can you just clarify, because one of the things that we come across in trying to raise the, improve the vernacular and how we collectively as we talk about the long-term services support waivers and what those wait lists and what those times are, so often we're getting from people like, well, I don't need, I, I make money, I don't need Medicaid. So can you clarify for people, like, how does some, like, who qualifies for Medicaid in the sense for this? So typically, uh, once the individual turns 18, they're not working. And we go off of that individual's income, and that may qualify you for Medicaid in most cases. It does, because the individual is not working. So even though mom and dad may be having a great uh, career and making a lot of money, the individual is considered just one entity, their own, their own person. And so typically, if they're not working again, um, their income is zero, and that qualifies them for Medicaid along with their disability. So, um, in that regards, and plus mom and dad are not gonna be there forever, um, God bless them, but that life, right. life happens, right, <laughs> yeah. as we know. And so the individual will need those long-term supports and services in place for when mom and dad are not there, or for when the caretaker is not there, or when the older sister or older brother decides not to be the permanent caretaker for you know <laughs> little Johnny or little Susie. So that's where those long-term supports and services really kick in, yeah. because again, life happens, you know, changes happen, um, but if you're plugged in to the IED authority, those supports and services are in place for you year after year after year. Thank you. And so Giovanni is always so excellent at like being succinct and wrapping that up in a bow to help people understand that as we work to increase um, expectations, letting people understand and know the expectations, not just of their individual that they're caring for and they love, but of the system of care that will be there to support them when they're in school, when the yellow bus stops, when they want employment, and then who's going to be with there to make sure all this comes through. And so just to clarify for that, those long-term services support, so the safety net service, there's all sorts of great um, programs in GR that are happening, but the ones that are for that longer-term care, those wait lists at this time are between 12 and 15 years long. So we want to continue to push that message that getting connected with your local LIDA and getting on those interest lists or waiver interest lists and LTSS interest lists, now, as soon as you get that diagnosis, or even as soon as they start school, is so important because by the time they are 18, when they are not fully employed enough to have a to have not Medicaid services, if you try to get on those lists at 18, your 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 loved one could be in their 30s before they get that. So that is where some of that messaging comes from. And again, the themes across these um, Facebook lives with Autism Life and Links are to get everyone how many people are touching and caring for your individual with a disability but knowing what is re you're responsible for. And, as I, and that's why I advocate so much for starting transition process early on mm -hmm. because of the wait time of the, of the waiver list of the, of the long term service provider. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. We're um, all going to get yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I'm going to change that to start using that acronym. But that's why, you know, in, in early childhood, pre K, elementary school, Having those, having that information to get on that because 
it's hard, and, and we I, we do a session at, at Region 20 uh, for teachers, and we've done it at some conferences. You know, it's hard sometimes when you're learning that new diagnosis of, of yeah. IDD, of autism, you're learning about that, and now someone's telling you, oh, well, we need you to get over this for 10 years from now. It's hard to think 10 yeah. years down the road. You can barely think what's going to happen tomorrow or the next right. week. But it's just having that, you know, information given to you and having, you know, like I say, the art meeting meets at year, we meet annually. Yeah. Every year, and I talk to the teachers, bring it up every year. Mm -hmm. Talk to the parents, give them the information, give them the resources. Um, but ultimately, you know, what I want the parents to know is that it ultimately comes down to you as the parent making that phone call. You know, contacting the LIDA, contacting Texas Work Commission when they're age 14, um, and doing that because you're the, right now, you're the guardians for that. And we really, really want to start that process. But it, it's, I, I, I'm not saying I walk in your shoes. Um, the example, right? The, my my example is a little different. My older son has ADHD and dyslexia, uh -huh. and my wife struggled with dyslexia when he was diagnosed with dyslexia because she didn't know dyslexia. I knew it, and I'm not dyslexia, uh -huh. and I didn't work with that. Uh -huh. But she would really was like, oh wow, and his, 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 he can't read. His wife's like, oh, what's he gonna do? He can't, he can't, he can't. But it, but it was more, you know, from the parent side is is you hear Down syndrome, you hear autism. Right. If you Google that, you're gonna see a lot of negative and bad things yeah. that they're not going to be successful but it's really understanding all the positives that come out of that what can they do what are they able to do what are their strengths and, and applying that early on and now you get the support through school you get the support through the Texas Workforce Commission you get the support for uh, long term through ACOG and building that plan by a very young age you know and when I do my parent trainings I tell them don't prepare for after 22 at 21 and a half right that needs to start early on and have that continuous reinforcement throughout it because it's there, and you know, and we want you to be aware of that. So we all, all three of us, do a, a job of just making those connections for the families and the parents to have that, that knowledge of what's available. So we would think that we all rehearse this so very well because every transition, no pun intended, is perfect. So that when we talk about these things, every one of you has talked about the importance of starting early, right, and then getting connected and talking with the student about what they want to do, who they want to be when they grow up. And again, just reminding everybody, with your neurotypical children, you're doing this from a super young age. We just aren't doing it with our non-neurotypicals. So encouraging families to do the best, you have to modify, you know, but having the same conversations with your non-neurotypicals as you do with your neurotypicals. And so all of that gets us to a place where that individual is more confident in the, in the, in the parent or caregiver is hopefully feeling a little more. So this plan, as we talk about, you meet with the client and you want to know what they want to do, all right, so you want to be a doctor, it's really the scrubs, okay, so then what is it like, you know, how do, how do we work backwards from that? You guys are getting guys on this quick so that the so resources can be available to them later down the line, as well as the other influences and relationships that COG has to to, to connect with these things, and you're doing the education piece. In this plan, how are the conversations that they're having at school about what they want to be when they grow up, the conversation that you're having about what they want to be when they grow up, and then what the reality is? How are, how are you guys going to connect all these pieces to, to make sure there's good cross-information so somebody doesn't have to keep telling their story in three different places and something might be missed? So with that uh, comes the collaboration, and our collaborative model to where we really want our staff to be talking to each other and staffing um, the students' cases and really sharing information on what we're all doing. If the school's doing assessments, sitting together with the school partners and reviewing that information, seeing what services they're receiving from the school and what services we can provide as a VR transition services to supplement what the school is doing and support. Uh, that also, you know, ensuring that they are signing up to the waiver uh, program list for long-term supports because our VR services aren't intended to be long-term supports. So the school and VR work together to prepare the students. Uh, we really want to encourage, like I said, that communication is going to be key to this. So can you talk a little bit about that? The VR is vocational rehab, um, rehabilitation, vocational re rehabilitation services, which is can you clarify? So that that's the transition piece of getting to employment where they don't need support. Right. Can you clarify that for Right. So vocational rehabilitation services, we have services for students and for adults as well. But the transition piece, we really focus on preparing the students for transition into independent living, post-secondary education, and or employment. 
And so our goal is competitive integrated employment. We want to make sure that our students are able to obtain competitive integrated employment to where they are, it's a sustainable career um, to increase their independence so that they could be financially independent and you know, be a contributing member of society. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we all ultimately well, want. Out. Yeah. And so what does that look like initially? So you have the conversations, you, you helping them interview with skills? Like, can you talk a little bit about what does it look like for, for the mom who's got a five-year-old, right? Who's like, oh, I don't need all this, like, oh, but this is what this is what we're gonna get into when we're getting older. What does it look like? Dispel some of that. So for the most part, with transition, we focus on the five WIOA uh, key transition um, services, which are career exploration, job readiness, um, work-based learning, so building up those soft skills, building up, uh, we have different programs and modules where we could provide uh, services to, again, do career exploration, counseling on post-secondary education, self-advocacy, um, preparing them with the soft skills, even um, work-based learning to where once they receive some classes on soft skills and um, depending on their disability and the impediment that's causing, we would address that, whether that be uh, a speech barrier or impediment. Um, or you know whatever else could be, but to prepare them for that transition. So, so other than that, the, so, so, no, sorry, she said that mom with that five year old. Yeah. You know, at, at that point, it's really career exploration. Yeah. You know, what, it's, like, like, it's like being outside, right. it's playing in the dirt, it's playing yeah. video games. You know, there's actually uh, the um, uh, labor market LMCI division. I believe has like a really good color book. It's just career exploration. Really? Yeah. Oh. Color, you go through the color book. Oh, Say right. that again right. for the world. It's the TWC. LMC. Labor, so what is it? Labor market, career, career, career yeah. LMCI. So, LMCI. It's a division of Texas Workers Commission, and they I provide a lot of resources. Yeah. Um, and I use some of the sessions, but it's just it's a color book, and I use it when I see little kids. Hey, color, what are you not doing? But it's just really, what is the fiber like doing? Does he like playing by himself? Does he like being social with his cousins or his brothers and sisters? Does he, you know, sometimes enjoy watching TV? Even the fiber sometimes can work the phone better than I can work the phone. Oh, uh, are those, so, you know, looking at those skills they have, in a sense, you're kind of finding out what is his strengths. At the same time, hey, let's go outside. I don't want to be outside. Well, he does, okay, maybe he should get a job as a, as a, as a master. <laughs> That's right. And so it's just those little things that you can find out early on. Does he like sports? What's his favorite team? Those little things can add to that transition plan of what we can build on their strengths later to see what they like. Yeah. You know, versus waiting until they're 14. Oh, by the way, what are you like doing? We, we can start that process early on. And their strengths and their needs, and uh, we, we call it SPIN, strengths. Uh, strengths, preferences, interests, and needs. And that's what we build the transition plan. What are they good at? What are they not so good at? What do they like doing? What do they don't like doing? Um, because as much as I want students to know their strengths, I think it's very important to know what your what your needs are. What do we have to work on? What do we have to Even us, it's yeah. like 47, so, um, you're not, but you know, I don't know, I don't know, mine whole. So, like, she's more I was like, she's so mature, mine are so mature. <laughs> Anywho, anyone that's not 20, uh, let's just say that, you know, we're even doing some of that stuff. We're like, what are the, I'm um, looking over my shoulder right before we had this Facebook Live, we're talking about some of my areas of um, need in my people who are around me as I'm a professional. The stuff we're all good at, and the stuff we're not, and that's okay. How do we develop those skills and those talents and those strengths so that we have purposeful work? And so much of that constantly is having that purposeful work, having that, for as much as sometimes we want to sit home and bench Netflix, it's Friday, where's a margarita, right? But really, what gives us joy and what makes us feel like a contributing member of our community has a lot to do with what we're doing with our days. And so helping the student vision helps the parent vision, right? And so one thing as you touched on is, is the student vision. We really want the students involved in this. We really want them, especially at age, so one of the things with the transition planning at age 14 is, and it's, it's in the law, is students have to be invited to their art meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, parents, bring them to the art meeting. Have them, if they can't sit there for the entire hour, bring them in for the first five, last five. So they know what we're talking about, because the art meeting is designed around the student. We're talking about the student. Yeah. We're developing plans, accommodations, classes for the student. Have them involved in that meeting. Because by the student understanding their strengths, and this is another part of a big epic for us, is having the students, as much as they can, understand their disability. Mm -hmm. What is Down syndrome? That's right. Can you understand what that is? Can yeah. you understand this is why you're really good at this area, this is why you're not so good at this area? 
And then if the student understands that, now they, in my opinion, now they can add more to their plan. Now they can tell you what I don't like. Okay, let's not do that. Let's not do that. And so there's things that if they're in that meeting and they're part of that planning, like all of us, I'm more involved in the plan if I'm part of the plan. Right. But if I'm involved in the goals, nah, I don't want to do it. You're so funny because when you meet, the parent's not there. You're meeting with the individual, yeah. finding that kind of stuff out. So it's this it's this imbalance, which is part of what this collaboration is supposed to be doing, exactly. is making sure the information gets to, as well as the cross-reinforcing of what a parent needs to know, what a parent or caregiver needs to know, what an individual needs to know, everything from their rights, so the parent knows that, but so that the student yep. and self-advocate and future person who won't necessarily, mm -hmm. or may not have somebody, mm -hmm. standing next to yep. them saying, you need to ask for, you guys are trying really hard. I mean, again, I, I always get goosebumps during Facebook well, Live, well, it's so at, exciting, at, at, right? at 18, the state of Texas could choose an adult. That's right. They don't care about your content level. That's at right. At 18, you're an adult, so they haven't prepared them to be an adult. Mm -hmm. And the parents are very much an important part of that role, but when they're 18, guess what a student can do at 18? Yeah. I don't want my mom in the yard. That's right. Well, guess what? I've told three moms in my careers, sorry, I can't come to the yard. My nurse with an 18-year-old told me he didn't need me, <laughs> and so that day we went to the doctor's, and guess who paid his own copay? <laughs> that tune changed so by the time we got on school that night, to be clear. Well, I just need you financially, as well as I later on. Yeah. I need someone financially too, but it's just yeah. me, buddy. I'm but sorry. But that's an important yeah. piece of, of building yeah. that capacity into the students and knowing they can do that. And it's also a way of doing that. Um, there's, you know, there's a way to have a conversation. There's a way to get your point across. There's a way to shake hands and make eyes. So how do we? How do we? How do we learn that? How, where are those skills uh, taught? Uh, right. Part of it's at school. I think there's part of it, but also part of it's at home. Think about it. one of the best things at home that I, uh, I learned is a parent is the student or the child's first job coach. Think about that. When you get your child chores and they do it wrong, who corrects them? You, as yeah. a parent. And my son with ADHD, how he cleans the kitchen, is not how I want the kitchen. That's cleaned. right. And so who corrects that? Parents. And, but yeah. as that gets older and your boss tells you something and you don't do it right, you, you, you get corrected, but that only could lead to unemployment. So a parent is the first job coach. It, that's and so, that learns at home. I'm so glad you said that because it's you're right. Again, and so what you do with your neuro, neurotypical guy, recleaning the commode mm -hmm. or whatever, you mm -hmm. have doing those same things. So trusting your your individual okay. to have roles and responsibilities and not to forget. So yesterday's Facebook Live was really neat. It was don't put down the phone and it was using smartphone technology to promote that independence, which again, sometimes parents are like, you know, but you can map, you can do all these super cool things. And it came into the employment sector in that sense of when you do have that job, like your reminder for the bus or your, when it's time to take a break, like setting the alarm for this is how long my break is. Or yep. using certain apps they're talking about, um, some of the uh, HV and some of the bigger chains mm -hmm. that looking, they all have apps to know how to navigate places. I guess four alarms in the morning. Wake up, medicine, let the dogs out of the bus. Right? All in the morning. I love it. So, we really, if you had to leave here and let the Facebook world know one of the most important things that you think communication and transition planning does for a family or for an individual, an individual first, but then for the emotional well being of that family. Well, the communication piece is most important because like you said it's reducing the number of times that they have to repeat their story repeat the same thing over and over so once we collaborate and we get that information we can better support the student um, and build on whatever it is that we're working towards um, communication also comes from the student participating in the arts yes the student is invited to the arts meetings but a lot of the times the uh, parents uh, tend to shelter to say for them have, instead of yeah students that have disabilities they they tend to be a little bit more sheltering and speak for them yeah. but it, in in reality it's kind of casting a disservice because it's it's limiting their ability to self advocate and ask for what they need and increase that independence um, so when they participate I would say if they're in the RV let them enter let them 
come up with their own answers, you know, instead of speaking for them, even if it takes a little longer. Right, right. Saying, give, give them time. Give give them time. time. And again, they were talking about the phone yesterday. It's like, if the person has a communication challenge, they're going to have a communication prep challenge for the rest of their life. Right. So you answering for them yep. is not going to solve it. So let them find the picture mm -hmm. and exactly. show the show art people yeah, the picture the of an astronaut. Mm -hmm. So it's just so neat that there's so, there are a lot of tools and again, we're just trying to dispel and hope and encourage that. So, get. Yeah, one of the um, key items that I wanted to mention, um, based upon your question, uh, a key takeaway I would say is collaboration. And that's collaborating with the families. You don't have to go about this process alone. You know, each of our agencies is more than willing to assist you in this transition process. Particularly, um, Sam mentioned the art process. You know, you can request that a TWC counselor attends that art. You can request that a local IDD authority, you know, service coordinator um, participates um, in your art um, planning. Now, that may, you know, involve you signing some consent forms, which are perfectly fine, but the point being that help is available to you in order for you to help navigate this process, because it can be very daunting. You know, all the paperwork, all the supports, all the services, all the appointments you have to go to, all the different agencies you have to deal with, it can be very daunting. That's just one aspect of your life, right? But again, help is available, just a matter of you asking for it. Um, and then, of course, you know, going through, you know, the consents and all that legal yeah. stuff. But again, help is available. Take full advantage of it. Um, and hopefully, you know, um, through our collaboration, through this model that we're putting in place here locally, um, is to benefit the families and these individuals um, for the long term. And, and I'm sorry, also letting us know, each agency that you're working with, whatever agencies you're involved with and receiving services from, that way each of us could staff and collaborate and get information, share information to better support the student and build a stronger plan with all that information. It, again, as if we've scripted this out, all perfect graphs to what you all are doing here today, what you're doing in your individual roles and in your individual organizations. Um, and Giovanni, always like, knowing that there are people out there to help. We know that the system of care can be frustrating and daunting and you have to sign different waivers and you have to allow consent and people are going to have to share information about you in order to make the best plan for your family and that individual. But one of the things that Autism Life Plan Links does is that we our, our design is not just convening all these people, raising awareness, and impacting public policy, but is by creating a one electronic record for every individual. And we do that through an electronic, uh, you know, in the cloud, I don't use our language, you know, in, up in the sky somewhere platform that is really, when, you know, when you talk about your EMR, your electronic medical record, everyone knows that lingo. What we have done at Autism Lifeline Links is create what we're calling an ESSR, an electronic social services record, um, which can include education and everything else. So that's the way I kind of jargon it to help people understand. And so, for example, in that record, a family who was an individual with, um, on the autism spectrum or a comorbid IDD with that autism, they can go online to autismlifelinelinks.org, click the register now button, and they populate, you know, your age, your date of birth, where did you get your diagnosis, uh, what school district are you in, all those kinds of things, and then sign a consent, they click the button, and then a care coordinator will call them within 24 working hours say, how can I help you? And they finish populating the record. That family may say, you know what, I've heard about this waiver stuff. I watched a Facebook Live the other day, and I heard about some waiver thing or LT some, some, some I'm supposed to be on, and how do I, what do I do? The care coordinator does an electronic referral over to ACOG. Nice. And then ACOG has the responsibility within 24 working hours to start to contact that family. There's three contacts, one email. These are our rules. Everyone complies with them. And then they say, but you know what? I'm exhausted. I need some respite. Then they'll send an electronic referral over to Respite Care San Antonio or Special Reach or Camp Camp. All of these things, and I'll list those partners that are in the electronic record the right in a moment. But even if it's not in there, so right now, um, Texas Workforce, Workforce Solutions isn't in there, but by getting through ACOG or ARC for case management, you're going to get to Texas Workforce. Right. We will be adding more partners over the next year and then for perpetuity in the electronic sense, but we're basically um, eliminating the, the fax machine, the old fax referral that we all used to do, or the calling a friend and saying, hey, Giovanni, I just talked to this parent, I need you to call him. And what it really does is create a longitudinal record. So to your point, Myra, 
it that communication, anyone who has who cooperatively works on that client can look at that record and see what their peers in the community are doing so that you are cross-informed, we're not duplicating, we're not replicating services, and we have a collaborative approach to that. So those electronic referral partners um, that by clicking the register now button you can receive electronic referrals to our Allen Area Council of Governments and IDD uh, population, any baby Cayman, Autism Treatment Center, Autism Community Network, the Arco San Antonio, Brighton Center, Camp Camp, the Center of Healthcare Services, um, Children's Hospital San Antonio actually does um, referrals out like when they get their guys in they send them out into the community so that they're connected until that diagnosis happens. Um, Disability SA, Down Syndrome Association, Respite Care San Antonio, South Wind Fields, and Special Beach. Um, and like I said, we're adding partners. And the neat thing is, is all isn't trying to replace anyone's role. We're just convening and creating one place where the people who are funneling it, right? And then they go out to the world because all those partners I listed, plus the ISDs, plus Region 20, plus TWC, and everything else, everybody's doing a great job. We don't need to replicate it. We just need to make sure everyone's communicating and on the same page. So. Um, in there also is the community resource guide where all of these people, as well as the place to get a haircut for somebody on the spectrum with sensory yes. issues, is in there. Um, uh, grants and waivers, all that stuff is in there. So go to our website and we um, will be putting the new, uh, in first week in March, we'll be putting up the new community resource guide, which has also been translated into Spanish. Awesome. So that is all searchable in there. Cool. Um, so, so much more. Uh, we will be Facebook Live again next month. And you guys will love this if you don't know. So we are having um, a, young, a young man from the Reddicks, working with all y'all in the Reddicks, works at um, Smash and Crab. And his level of functioning, he can basically, his high, his high skill is he can count to 10. So he measures, he waves the crab, so, you, so the cooks know how much nice. crab is going to think. So, and then um, Leslie, uh, from Southwood Fields and um, someone from PCSI to talk about success stories that you guys helped create by starting the conversation, getting them to the right people, mm -hmm. and then building upon that. So now here's some super success stories of people, whatever their level of functioning, are able to find purpose and employment. Um, so keep looking for our Facebook Lives and um, look on our website, check out their websites. And again, I want to thank you all for being here. I Thank think you. that's it. Do we have anything else? No? Everybody have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you so I appreciate much. you. Thanks for tuning in.